This is the face of a killer. His name is Mitchell Kwai. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Might as well have murderer wrote across my forehead. This is his victim, his wife, Lindsay Kwai, age 21, and the mother of two young children. She was brutally murdered. A murder is a murder. Who could forgive somebody that's murdered all their children? For 18 months, Mitchell Kwai arrogantly denied his guilt. He lied to the police, the press, and to Lindsay's family. I know the truth. I'm the only one that does know the truth. We spent the last months of Mitchell Kwai's freedom documenting the life of a prime suspect who thought he'd got away with murder. <laughs> Tonight on Real Life, we reveal Mitchell's cruel campaign, and we join Lindsay's family on a search to find out the truth of what happened to their daughter. I want to see him behind bars. But I also want to know where my daughter is so we can bury her. Lindsay Kai disappeared on uh, Christmas Day last year. The police, after months of searching for Lindsay, are now treating it as a murder inquiry. And as a result, they've dug up her husband Mitchell's garden and scoured his house, convinced that she's dead. They have yet to find a body. Mitchell is the only one, in fact, who believes that she's still alive, and he's, he's here with us now. Mitchell, why do you think they seem to be so convinced that you're, a, what do they call you, a legitimate suspect? Uh, well, this, I suppose they say the husband's always the suspect. Um, you should know by now that TV cameras do not lie. Each time you have appeared on TV, your facial and body language tells the viewer that you have murdered your wife. Did you kill her? No. <laughs> Why would you walk out on the kids as well? I don't know. I don't know. It's a question you could only ask Lindsay. But your children deserve to know where their mother's remains are. Do you think, you're in your own mind, that she could possibly be dead? No. No. Not at all. You are a clever murderer. You found time to dispose a body long before the police got involved and all the clues were lost. We all know you did it. Signed, Justice Once. Did you kill Lindsay? I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to answer that question because I don't need to. You make up your own mind because eventually everyone will find out. Southport. Christmas Eve, 1999. It was the end of a difficult year for 24-year-old Mitchell Kwai. He claimed that his wife, Lindsay, walked out on him a year ago, abandoning him and her two young children on Christmas Day. Okay. Actually, Mitchell had killed her and was using the image of an abandoned father for public sympathy, callously promoting the lie that Lindsay was still alive. If Lindsay was dead, they would have found her by now especially after all the searches and everything they've done. Um, husbands do kill the wives, but unfortunately for them... Lindsay's they, devastated family knew it was a lie. Is there anything I can do to try and help? Her father, Peter, was never in any doubt about his daughter's fate, and he wasted no opportunity to prick Mitchell's conscience. It was put up by me for uh, Mitchell's benefit so that every day of his life he saw a picture of Lindsay. You must do something to the conscience if you if you are responsible for doing something to somebody and you see the picture face every day, it's gonna have some effect on you. And that was the idea. If he thinks that I've killed his daughter, I wouldn't sit in the same room as the guy. But one day he'll be on my doorstep apologizing. For almost a year, Merseyside police had been searching and digging, but they could find nothing, no body, no evidence of foul play. Without a body, they had an almost impossible task to prove that she was not just missing, but actually dead. My view is if we've got the body, we've got the man. I don't believe for one minute that Lindsay has gone out on Christmas Eve and has come back in on Christmas Day and abandoned those children. She loved her children, I don't believe that. What is frustrating for me is I know she's dead. Mommy. It breaks my heart because I don't know if one day I'm going to have to turn around to Robin and say, look, some psychos killed your mum. You know, I wouldn't put it exactly like that, but I know how I felt when I lost my mum. 
with her being so young, I suppose it's different, but I just don't know what to say to her anymore. I don't know what to, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. Lindsay was the youngest daughter in the Wilson family of six children. She was a fun-loving, outgoing, outspoken. She wasn't shy, not as she got older. She was as a baby. I mean, if anyone went to get her, she'd run off shouting her dad. In February 1995, Lindsay was only 17 when she became pregnant by her first serious boyfriend. They got engaged. Most of the time, she was happy about it. You know, she didn't, like, think of abortion or anything like that. She was pregnant and that was it. But Lindsay had second thoughts about the marriage and broke off the engagement. Five months pregnant, living alone and frightened about her future, she met Mitchell Kwai, a 20-year-old croupier. The first thing that attracted me to Lindsay, I think, a smile. And I saw her, I was like, oh, God. Oh, she's gorgeous, and I fell in love. And from that night on, we were never apart. We, we, that was it. A week later, we were engaged. About a week later after that, the wedding was set, and that. We, were, um, we were married after five weeks. It was a big step, a big step. They were married on the 1st of August, 1995. Mitchell had no family at his wedding, apart from his younger brother, Elliot. Ah, now then. These are Lindsay's wedding photographs. Now, Peter, that's his brother, Elliot. Lindsay, Mitch. Lindsay on the rebound, that's what it was. Even that day ended up with a big argument at the end of the night. So maybe that was a sign of things to come. I don't know. I just can't believe it's <coughs> happened to us. You read about these things in the papers and you have pity for the families. And the next thing you know, it's happened to us. I sometimes sit there in, in the back porch and I look out on the garden and things spring into mind like Lindsay's cold somewhere. All the family's a victim, aren't they? So the way it's affected my family, especially my son Peter, really taking it bad. It's not the same boy he was. It's really affected Paula and a dad who doesn't say much, but at the end of the day, I think it'll affect him more. I just asked him where he's put Lindsay. Just ask him to be a man and tell us where she is. Own up to what he's done. Because so at the end of the day, he's gonna pay the price of what, he, what he's done. By January 2000, over a year after Lindsay's disappearance, Mitchell decided he'd finally enough press exposure. This is uh, me saying I didn't want to be in the newspapers anymore. Saying that I've had time to think over Christmas. Don't say I have. Just leave it to them now. I would describe Mitchell as an egotist. I mean, he's always seeking publicity. Uh, I understand that he keeps all sorts of newspaper cuttings at his home. And for me, um, he's just basking in all this notoriety. The police have been going around interviewing all of the people that I've ever slept with and stuff like that. Um, I, mean, I mean, I know they're clutching at straws now, like, but what do they think? I shagged her to death or something, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Completely pathetic. Lindsay was last seen alive on the 15th of December, 1998. She was a regular at the corner shop. Perhaps about a week or 10 days before Christmas, I remember seeing Lindsay. And um, after that, then all of a sudden, I never seen her at all after that. Lindsay was reported missing by a social worker on February the 5th, 1999. She had not been seen for 53 days and Mitchell had said nothing to her family. Why did he not tell us? He was so fond of coming down, passing messages in the past, like, give these flowers to Lindsay, give this note to Lindsay. So why didn't he tell anybody? Lindsay's family, yeah, they, I was, they're the last people I'd contact. Why would I contact Lindsay's family? Lindsay's family, I have not, I, well, we just don't like each other. 
Mitchell claimed Lindsay was still alive and that he'd seen her in an unbelievable series of coincidences. There was a picture of Lindsay on the front of the visitor and he turned and says to me, she'll have to come forward now. He said, because I've seen her in the marketplace and she'd been seen in the black Mercedes. As I come round here, Lin Lindsay was the front seat passenger. I said, well, if that's the case then, if you've seen her, where's the rest of the people that's seen her? She was like here. There. So that's when she said to call me in the fucking wank, but that's where she was stood by me. And he says, well, I said, so you're trying to tell me then there's some dishonest people out there? He says, yes. I says, bullshit. I said, I don't believe you. And off he went. The police also didn't believe him. They were convinced he had murdered her and he was arrested on February the 27th, 1999. He says, well, as you know, we've been looking for Lindsay for a few months now and um, we've had no sign of her, so we're arresting you on suspicion of murder, incitement to cause grievous bodily harm and fraud. Now, he willingly admitted the frauds because he, he couldn't escape the fact that he had forged Lindsay's signature on her benefit books after the Christmas time. Mitchell said nothing and most of the charges were dropped for lack of evidence, but he was convicted of the fraud. I'm doing community service for uh, cashing cheques out of Lindsay's account, claiming income support, which I was entitled to anyway. Apart from, it was just, it wasn't in my name. Me having to do this will leave me with the kids. I wouldn't piss on her if she was on fire. Mitchell had narrowly escaped a murder charge. His confidence grew and local people began to believe his story. The folk that come in the shop seem to get the opinion of perhaps, has he done anything? Has he just disappeared? Has she run away? Mitchell had made many enemies, but he could still rely on his oldest friend for support. What? I think she's gone away. The police, it's their job. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year to catch criminals. It's his, it's his job to look after his family. And if they had one shred of evidence, this man would be now sat in Walton. It's like every time they started a new search, like you see Jeff Sloan in the newspapers or like on the television saying, we are confident that we are going to find something. something to do. That's why I bought him some Just For Men, because they're um, you know, like a change of colour, you know, but, <laughs> but you might improve his confidence a bit. You'd have to be seriously insane there uh, if you'd done something wrong because it's going to slam you for that. <laughs> well, he sent me this and it's not even my hair colouring. And here I am as a senior investigating officer trying to find this man's missing wife. And he's really goading me. By January 2000, Mitchell had good reason to be even oh, more yeah. confident. What? Lindsay Hunt has stalled. The investigation into the disappearance of Bert Lovett. Lindsay Clark. The police, with no success, stopped digging. Lindsay's father, however, refused to give up. Every spare moment was used in what appeared to be a fruitless search. We've done family searches, been in lakes, ditches, canals, woods. Spent hours and hours and hours digging, wading through stinking water and everything. You can see that the, these fields here are only just round the corner from where Lindsay lives. That's the way the police think about it, anyway. In August 1995, Mitchell and Lindsay's first home was a small flat in Boundary Street, Southport. Her daughter, Robin, from a previous relationship, was born. Immediately, the marriage to Mitchell started to fail. I mean, at first, he, he, you know, he did come across as this, you know, nice bloke. You know, un until all of the violence and that started, then saw another side to him. She wanted him out, out the flat. And I said, you've only just got married, give it a chance. And she said, you don't understand, he hits me. One year after Robin was born, Lindsay discovered she was pregnant to Mitchell but by now she had serious doubts about her marriage to him. She told me it was Mitch's child, but she wouldn't bring it into the world the way things were at home. 
you know, I was going around telling everyone absolutely completely made up. We got home that night and she told me she was going to have an abortion. To cut a long story short, she had an abortion and I left her. I thought she was a very strong, brave girl because she had to cope with that on her own because at the time she wasn't having any contact with me, me mum or my dad. It was sick of me, it really did. Absolutely sick of me. There's something that would argue that all those circumstantial chain of events gives you an extremely powerful motive. Yeah, it gives me motive and I can understand being a suspect, but I, I'm not going to stand here and protest my innocence with anyone because I don't need to. Right? Yes, it gives me motive. I've said this all along. I can understand being a suspect. I'm not bothered being a suspect. All I want to do is find out where Lindsay is. It does give me motive. I've never argued with that. Sad. I mean, do you know what, I'm just, I mean, any idea what I felt like when this first began? People accusing me, well, not accusing me, but saying things in the newspapers about that, people talking about me, people thinking I'd kill me. Do you know any idea what it felt like, how much, how much I had to, how many times I've walked out my front door and how many times I've, had to, I've thought to myself, I just can't, I don't want to walk out there with people looking at me, thinking I've done something like that to my wife. Any idea what that feels like? Mitchell never forgave her for aborting his child. He beat her, and she took out an injunction against him. After just a year of marriage, Mitchell walked out, leaving Lindsay alone for the Christmas of 1996. That was his days when he'd sleep around. I used to have Lindsay down at mine saying to me, I can't go in this shop, I can't go in that shop, because every shop I go in, there's someone he slept with. This was while he was married to her. Even under suspicion of murder, Mitchell kept up his old habits. I'm not going to deny it. I've not been completely celibate over the last you know, anything, but if you get offered it on a plate, you take it. The one woman turned around to me and said, I don't care if you have done it. She said it actually turned her on, the fact she didn't know whether I'd done it or not. And so I kicked her out. In their desperation to find her, Lindsay's family sought any help they could get. Letters off people. Psychic drawings of where she might be buried. People seem to know what's gone on, but they don't know where the body is. Well, they've given drawings or things like that, but it could be anywhere. It's just that a lot of the psychics have said she's surrounded by water. There's that much water in Southport. Where do you look? wish she could come to us and tell us where she is. She must be able to come and visit one of the members of our family. Like she said herself to the psychic, it's hard to find me. So he has done a good job, really, of covering his tracks. Oh, you on? Your ghost? Yeah. <laughs> In April 1997, after five lonely months, Lindsay took Mitchell back. We first got back together, it was brilliant. When Lindsay wanted a baby, I wasn't too sure. She fell pregnant pretty quick. Um, I was very dubious because I didn't, after what had happened when she got pregnant the first time, I didn't, you know, I just didn't, I couldn't accept it in a lot of ways. But late one night, Mitchell's violence snapped again. By now, Lindsay was four months pregnant. Entering the House of Horrors. Look at the House of Horrors. Look at them. I heard Lindsay's footsteps going out, and then I looked out the window, and she was running down the road with Robin. And then I heard banging. All them windows were smashed. There was a door lying out here. Um, glass on the road from the car being smashed. Blood on the paintwork because he used his fists. Where's the doors gone? I just completely lost the plot. Went absolutely berserk, absolutely mental. I've said to Lindsay, if you'd have been in that house, he would have killed you, and one day he's going to kill you. To me, I always felt there's a spark of uncertainty and spontaneity about Mitchell that fascinated her or thrilled her. Um, and although there was the inherent danger of, of the spontaneous violence towards her. After long periods of separation, she sort of craved that spark again. They were both evicted, 
but they stayed together for their son Jack's birth in October 1997. It was to be a temporary lull. The following year, Mitchell walked out for good. I expected us to get divorced. I expect that to be it, out of the way, gone, over and done with. Peter Wilson lived a mile from Mitchell's home, and every week he had to collect Lindsay's children. It was a painful journey to face the man he was convinced had killed his daughter. I can go round and, and take the kids off him and try and keep as calm as possible. I mean, for, for the sake of the kids, my sake and, and Lindsay's sake. Hatred, I think. That's the feeling that I feel it's with. But it's a feeling that you've got to keep under control. It's sometimes it's harder to do than others. I'd never go in the house. If he said you want to come in and wait for them, I'd always wait outside. Are you ready? Come on, Joe. Ooh, good ass kiss. You've got the pyjamas and all that? Yeah, I've got all the stuff. No, there's, cream, there's cream in there for his back. I'd like him to come in and sit down and talk. But he won't. I couldn't walk up to the front door and face the person who I think killed my daughter. I couldn't do that. So I suppose if he really is telling the truth to an extent, then I admire the guy in a way. Who's that? Mrs. Who's on the donkey? Me. No. No, Mummy. Lindsay was never away from her children. She took them everywhere she went. She'd walk for miles with the double buggy. Mummy. She looked after them really well. Mummy. Mitchell was never there for the children. Never. There. It's upsetting when she says, I can't find me mummy, can you help me find me mummy? She thinks she's at Grandad's. Oh. She was sat on the kitchen floor and she said to me, my mummy's dead. And I said, who's told you that, Robin? And she said, I can't remember. And she was in like a daze. And then she wouldn't answer anything else after that. Many people had their own suspicions about what happened to Lindsay. Late one night in January 2000, Mitchell received an anonymous phone call. Hello, is that Mitchell? Mitchell Quay? Yeah, well, uh, something you should know, Mitchell. We know you're guilty. Your conscience, it must be burning in you, what you have done to that poor girl. You're an animal, you're a beast, you're the devil, and your conscience will destroy you. You will be caught, because justice will be served. And they're sick, and things like that. Sick. Idiots. I will get him. After what he's put us through this last 12 months, it's a joke. 13 months after Lindsay's disappearance, Mitchell was desperate to know if the police had any new lines of inquiry. So he spoke to the investigation team. It's a remarkable call from a prime suspect in a murder inquiry. Am I still under suspicion of murder? I mean, is, is, am, I, am I still a suspect in this murder inquiry? If you... Yeah. Is there is there any other suspect? I mean, I'm not asking for names. Oh no, it's nothing specific. It's just, I mean, if you can understand the situation I'm in, I mean, the police have made it, but basically publicly known that they think I've murdered my wife, don't they? Really? Is everyone on working on the inquiry? Have they have they all given up on finding Lindsay alive? The strain was now also telling on Lindsay's family. You can tell in his face he's not happy. He's worried. He looks worried every time. Does he so sit and think what it's doing to us, though? No. no Just because we didn't it. weren't close knit family or anything, doesn't mean at the end of the day you're not going to feel it. Because I tell you what, you feel it even worse. You know what they say: what goes around comes around. If someone knew that it had happened, surely to God they'd see us on the telly, appealing for her and the papers, and come forward and say, look. Or on the news, you see someone's missing, and you say, oof, that's a bit dicey, she's dead -er.
After months of mounting pressure, Mitchell had decided to go on the offensive against the police. He invited a journalist from a local paper to his house and presented his new story. All right. Here yeah, well, there's been some developments uh, regarding uh, the legal aspects no! of the case. No! I'm sorry, you <laughs> Missing mum, husband, just so. One minute he's leaving it to the police to sort it out. Now he's suing the police because of uh, arresting him or something. Is it right to arrest someone with no evidence? No evidence whatsoever. Not one thing. I can't understand it, really. Because he was arrested and charged with three offences and, and uh, was convicted of two of them. So what was your time like when you were in custody? It was, it was horrible. You, you, can, you, you can imagine, I mean, I've never... It's, I've never been in the cells before, before that time. It says, like, I've never been in a cell before. Oh. I'm sure that when he was arrested for the damage he did to Lindsay's house in Boundary Street, he was put in a cell. I will not stop until they either apologise to me or I get compensated because I think I deserved it. I've been branded a murderer in this town by them. This is just the sort of article now that will start to stir all the family up now. I've got to the point now with the more pressure they put on me, the stronger I'm getting and the more determined I am to find Lindsay and sue the balls off the police. I've had enough of Jeff Sloane. Well, I'm very frustrated by it, but, I mean, I'm experienced enough now to know that he, he hasn't got a leg to stand on in terms of, of suing the police. <laughs> Make sure you get that what they're thinking about proving it. About you know, proving it, like, yeah. yeah. I think that's probably going to be one of the lines yeah. we use, yeah. Or maybe the headline. I'll have a look at it. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. just think the headline on Wednesday is probably going to be oh, something. Mitchell sues police or something. Yeah. Um, what to sue police. So what's happening there? I've got legal aid. We're getting a barrister up. Asking for advice, asking for advice, isn't it? We've got a, we've got a strong case, really strong case, yeah. so... Well, just tell me this, and what does Lindsay's dad think of it all? He think, well, from what I know, I mean, I've never sat down... To, I've asked him to come into my house and sit down and talk to me, um, but he won't. I mean, it's like, like I've, said, well, I've started saying to the police, do you think I have done something to Lindsay and prove it? Yeah. Cos I'm not going to stand here and start saying, oh, I'm innocent, yeah. yeah. we've got nothing, yeah. All right, cheers, okay, Arthur. all right, cheers, Arthur. When Lindsay and Mitchell split up in April 1998, she was so scared of him that she was given a personal attack alarm. Woman's Aid helped her to find a new home, and she was soon making a new life for herself. The house was just a children's house. As you walked in through the front door, there was toys everywhere. As soon as the her birthday had finished, she would plan for Christmas. She was a very loving mum, very loving. She talked about the hell she'd gone through, um, that she'd been beaten by Mitchell. I got the impression that Mitchell was violent, horrible, scary, not fit to be around women. And this was at mine, wasn't it? Lindsay described Mitch as being very cool until he snapped. Very violent. That was enough for us to not want him to know who we were or where we lived or who our children were and that he was someone that should be feared. She was frightened. She was a frightened young woman. In the summer of 1998, Mitchell was working at Southport Pleasureland. He was desperate to see Lindsay again. Um, I asked to see the kids. I was absolutely gutted. She wouldn't let me see them. It was the only way she knew she could get to me. Jack's first birthday in October gave Mitchell the opportunity to get back into Lindsay's life. To be completely honest with you, I didn't want anything out of the marriage. All I wanted to do was see my kids at the time. I hadn't seen them for that long. Curiously, Mitchell couldn't bear to part with his last gift to Lindsay. These are the last. A bunch of flowers I bought Lindsay. No. Uh, would have been in October. Something like that, I think. And um, they've been there uh, ever since. I don't want to get rid of them. She didn't tell her mum or me or, any, or anybody else that she'd taken him back. And that's <coughs> Lindsay's final mistake. With Mitchell and Lindsay back together, family and friends kept away but within weeks, Lindsay knew she'd made a terrible mistake. The only time I popped round was the 22nd of October, 
I took her to the shop. On the way home, she started crying. She let Mitch come back and she wished she hadn't let him come back. She can't get him out of the house. And she asked me, could I get him out of the house? And I said, well, no, because I've intervened before and we've fallen out and we haven't seen each other for months. And it's up to you to do something yourself about it. Hello, good evening, I'm Agnes. I'm Paula. I'm pleased to meet you. Good. I got to the house and she asked me to come in and Mitch was sat in the corner drinking a can of lager giving me, well, if looks could kill, I'd have died on the spot. Did you bring something? Yeah. With you? As I was leaving, she said, I'll give you my phone number, Paul. I said, yeah, give me your new number. Oh, I feel very upset at the moment as I get older these. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I feel as if I'm choking at the moment. I got outside in the car and she put the paper in my hand and I took it from her. She put her arms in the car, hugged me, kissed me. I don't know why, but I feel I want to cry as I get older these. I drove off I I and then I pulled up at home and realised, I thought, oh, it's all going to start again. I'm going to get all the trouble at my house. There's going to be arguments. But I opened the note and on the note it said, please help me. I do feel this lady is in the spirit world because it so close that. The next day I saw my mum mm -hmm. and I gave her the note. I said, this is what Lindsay's written. I feel I'm still in Southport. I'm not outside of Southport with this girl. She said she'd had him back because she felt lonely and she realised she'd made a mistake, but there was no one to help her anymore. And then, like I say, I read that note. Please help me. And, um... I wish I could turn the clock back. Despite her troubles, Lindsay was looking forward to Christmas 1998. She loved it, Christmas. I think it was the 11th of December. She popped up around tea time. I took her home, but we stopped off at the off licence at Berry Road and she went in to get me some cigarettes. And she come running out gave me a kiss and said, see you later, Mum. And I've never seen her since. I get the emotion on that. We found out that she's actually going to institute divorce proceedings again and had, had secretly sought an appointment with a solicitor. And we felt that Mitchell wasn't aware of that either because she's probably in a, in a row with him on the 15th, has let it slip that she's going to see the solicitor and that he's not going to see the children. And I felt that was it quite a big catalyst to, to what happened. Christmas Eve day, we had two black bags of presents in the car for Lindsay's children. I rung Lindsay in the morning to tell her that we'd be up with them. Couldn't get any answer. And at about 20 to 4, the doorbell went. And when I got downstairs, it was Mitchell quiet. And he stood there in this cold weather and rain in just this shirt and the two children in the buggy. And I said, um, I've been ringing Lindsay all day. And he says, oh, uh, the phone got broken in argument. I said, where's Lindsay? And he said, uh, she's in the house getting ready to go out with the mates. Anyway, I gave him the presents and this, that and the other. And I just said, I hope there's going to be no trouble tonight. And just, you, you, you know, it's going to be a quiet Christmas for you. And off he went. The next time I saw her was at 7 in the morning, Christmas Day morning. She came in, she was out, but she was wrecked. No, we got no car from Lindsay at Christmas, no presents or else. Didn't think too much of it because we left them to get on with it. She got up, um, I to say about half one, two o'clock, something like that. Got up, I had to go in the bathroom, like, had the shower going. She came down and um, got herself sorted out and left. Complete rubbish. I don't believe one thing he said. I believe he's harmed my daughter. Have I made up the story that I've just told? Well, one day everyone's going to find out, aren't they? I didn't do that. I haven't done anything to Lindsay. I'm not capable of doing something like that. Like I say, I'm not going to sit here and start saying yes and no to stupid things, stupid questions, questions I've already answered a thousand times. And just say again, and it's not a stupid question, it's a very serious question. Did you kill Lindsay? Wait and find out. Find out. Lindsay was last seen alive on the 15th of December 1998.
Her absence was not reported until February the 5th, 53 days later. She was not reported missing by Mitchell, her family, her friends or neighbors, but by a concerned social worker. I hate him. I mean, does he not have any feeling for what he's done? For that young girl that had no one in the end? She was just a lonely girl with two children. And I have to sit here and live with my guilt for not being there for her. So does the rest of the family. We shouldn't have done what we did. No, we shouldn't have done what we did. We should have gone round and, and seen what was happening. Then he wouldn't have been able to get away with what he's got away with. It's not just us that stopped going, all our friends stopped yes. going as well. Yeah, yeah. You know? Nobody's just They all going feel around. guilty, just like we did. Yeah, yeah. Go and get the cards, Liam. Mother's Day, 2000. Lindsay has been missing now for almost 16 months. I know your wish was for Lindsay to come back. To your mum, happy Mother's Day. It makes me annoyed to think that she's missed Mother's Day, you know, and the kids have. Well, that's something they're going to have to grow up with for the rest of their lives now. Is that from Danny? No, I think, yeah. I don't think I'm going to bother the spiritualists anymore. I'm going to try clairvoyance now. I might try one of them in a couple of weeks. Lindsay had been here, she would have been here all day today. Well, she'd have a bit of dinner and she'd probably fetch a bottle of wine with her. And splash out on presents, things she always liked to do. But, no, not this year. I've been around that, so. Mother's day at Mitchell's was tense as he finally lost patience with us. Is it difficult, my uh, Mitchell? No comment. Is it difficult on Mother's Day? I'm not getting into this, Chris. I've told you. No, don't. Why? Because I've told you. Finish. Don't put me in an um, um, Don't put me in a horrible position, Chris. Turn it off. Don't put it up, right. I don't mind you can fill my house. I told you. No. Right. At the end of the day, Mother's Day, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not doing anything. I don't want to talk about it anymore. We've done loads of filming. So I'm saying no. Right. You're not concerned how it makes you look? I'm not asked. Because I told you. In what way can I look any worse? What, like, in what way? What, what, I mean, I've been fucking arrested for murder. I've done fucking all sorts. I think he started to realise it was inevitable at some stage we were going to take some more action against him. My view was that the longer we waited, the weaker the case may be, because even then we were talking about a circumstantial case, and I felt that we needed to take some assertive action. You see stuff like this happening to people on the telly, like people doing press conferences and shit like that. When you just look at it and you look at it and you think, oh god, it's pretty sad, isn't it? And you just move on, turn over and watch Coronation Street, put neighbours on. But when you actually have to live it, you never stop thinking about it with you 24 hours a day. Even dream about it. Sometimes you think to yourself, are you going to pinch yourself and wake up? It's all a bit of a bad dream, but it ain't. It ain't. <sighs> Mitchell's bad dream was about to turn into a nightmare. Mitchell Kwai had been a prime suspect for 16 months and thought he'd beaten the police but his arrogance was about to be finally dented. What more can anyone do to me now? Nothing. I've been dragged through the newspapers, a few of the nationals, I've been on the television, I've been on Richard and Judy, and um, now I'm doing this, and I, I just, I've gone beyond caring what people think of me. I've said my bit, if people don't believe what I'm saying, that's tough shit, I don't care anymore. I know the truth, I'm the only one that does know the truth, seriously, you know what I mean, at the end of the day, I was the one who was there, here. After 16 months' investigations, the police knew Lindsay was not alive after the 15th of December, 1999. And they also knew Mitchell was lying about what happened that Christmas. At eight o'clock on the morning of June the 7th, 2000, Mitchell Kwai was arrested on suspicion of murder. 
Three officers from a search team are in uh, Mitchell Choir's house at the moment. They've been in there for about an hour and a half. Feels great after all these months. It's finally got him. It's a lot of weight off our shoulders, but it's not over yet, is it? Robin, <laughs> put it down. Yep, good to read it. Put him? No. Then it's over in a way, but maybe we'll find out now where Lindsay is in the next few days and what happened to her. Yeah, it's been on the news all, all morning. I hope somebody's got the decency to tell us. Ow! Get away! It hits home that you could now find out exactly what's been done to Lindsay. It might not be very nice too now. Mitchell was taken for two days of questioning, but refused to say anything. My officers on the interview team remember quite vividly watching him recoil as some of the questions were put to him, but he still maintained his right to silence. But his body language gave them a completely different story. He was silent for 36 hours, but the police knew they had him. And late in the evening of June the 8th, he was charged with murder regardless. It has a very strange effect on people that you can imagine being charged with murdering somebody. I feel he's probably gone to a solicitor and said, why has this happened? How has that happened? And I think his solicitor's probably said, well, this is reality. Mitchell, knowing he could no longer escape custody, broke down. And one hour later, he confessed everything. He'd spent 36 hours of no comment. And then when he decided to, to tell everything, we just couldn't shut him up. Not only had he admitted the offense, that he'd indicated areas where Lindsay's body was deposited. And it was only then it started to dawn on me that he'd actually cut her up. And everybody, absolutely everybody on the team were amazed. We just couldn't believe it. The following day, we followed Mitchell and the police on a horrifying tour to find Lindsay's remains. What I was hoping for, that he wasn't taking us on a wild goose chase and just seeking more publicity. I was amazed. He, he, he looked around and, and asked if the press were there because he was quite eager to be seen on camera. He was laughing and joking with the officers, no remorse whatsoever. These are the grim scenes of Mitchell Kwai revealing to the police the whereabouts of his wife Lindsay's broken body. He pointed to an area and said that he'd put the carcass, he referred to Lindsay's torso as the carcass. What will you do if the police find Lindsay's body? Be gutted. I'd be absolutely gutted. For the kids. What would you say to the kids? What do I say to Robin? What do I say to her? Mitchell had callously cut up his wife and the mother of his two children in the bath at their home. Uh, he'd cut her legs off, he'd cut her head off, and he'd cut her hands off. And systematically wrapped them in cloth and bags, and taped them up, and callously took them outside with the children and dumped the various body parts at locations that we've since found. He's one callous, evil bastard. That's all he is. Don't like swearing about him, but there's no words fit to describe the man. And unfortunately, a lot of the neighbours are on his side. Some of the remarks they would say about Lindsay was un unbearable. I bet they wish they'd never even said anything at all now. After 18 months, Peter Wilson's heartbreaking search was finally over. One human being to do that to another human being is just, just beyond, I'd say, normal people's comprehension. Lindsay had never left her children. She had never even left her home. On the 16th of December, 1998, Lindsay had arranged a solicitor's appointment to finalize the divorce and get Mitchell out of her home for good. Unable to take her final rejection, Mitchell killed her in the early hours of that morning. It's a nightmare, really. As I said, it just goes from bad to worse. Just got to put up with it. It's 
got to keep strong. You know, you feel like cracking up, but you, you know, you, I can't at the moment. There's a lot more to be done. Just sad, really. You should be playing with them, Mum. She spent a lot of time playing with them. She just shouts, Mummy, I want to see you. I wish Mummy's bed would fall out of the sky so I could get in and talk to her. It's very upsetting, this. And then she says, um, I wish I could die and go up to heaven with me, Mum. It's not fair to the kids. He's, he's not only destroyed our lives, it's, he's taken the mother away from two kids that Lindsay really loved. Mitchell had not only killed Lindsay, to save himself he had sullied the character of a loving mother. But worse still, he had bequeathed Lindsay one last cruel indignity. They say that Lindsay's head and hands were put in a bin bag and uh, put out for the refuse collection. So, and if that has happened, the chances of finding, finding them are non-existent, really. I don't think Lindsay will ever rest. I don't think the family will ever rest, knowing that we can't put her all to rest. Just diabolical. Mitchell Kwai was convicted of murdering Lindsay and sentenced to life in prison. His brother Elliot was sentenced to seven years for assisting him in the disposal of her body. What I believe truly happened to Lindsay is domestic violence at its worst and how it finishes for a lot of women and the fact that people don't talk about it and the fact that it isn't reported. Silence is violence as well. What do I say when you play that song? It's Lindsay's song. Because the word, isn't it? I can still feel you here, it says, doesn't it? That's what it says. She's too little girl. Big imagination. Never letting no one take it away. My biggest regret is probably giving my consent for her to marry him. And I think Lindsay's worst mistake was taking Mitch back. There's a better way for you and me to be. Something inside every one of us has died. I think when Lindsay died, it died with us as well. We've lost something that we weren't really looking after at the time. You'll always be someone's baby. Goodbye, my friend. Now you've got your connection, I could love and still be alive. To live with the fact that your sister's been murdered is just something you can't live with, but to find out what he's done to her, that is the worst thing. the ultimate victims of the children because they've been robbed of her. And when I meet Lindsay next in heaven, when they open the door, I hope she will meet with me with open arms and I will hear her say, pop, once more. Now, come on. No. Yes. <laughs>